Welcome everyone to the Edith Wheeler Memorial Library. This is the final se session of Art Gottlieb's lecture on the 20th century by decade part one. I would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor for this program, the Friends of the Library. Now, without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Art Gottlieb. Hi everyone. Thank you for joining me today. Um, I have my big list of notes, which basically is just 1940 through 1949. All right, so uh, I have three things written down here just as a note. The rest of it is going to come right off the top of my head. I know this pretty this period pretty well. Point of uh, um, our program, uh, or at least the way I'm framing the subject matter, um, is to talk about the things that have happened during the years that we're discussing, right? In this particular case, 1940 to 1949. And what I want to do is put it in context, all right? So instead of just facts and figures, what I, what my overall goal is to show how this period of time or any period of time fits into the larger scheme of everything that's happening in the world and happening domestically in the United States and how it shaped literally the world that we're living in now. Um, I spend a lot of time teaching in a lot of different places and there are people who know history and there are people who think they know history. I know that, you know, I'm getting into a zone here where it's going to sound like I'm arrogant if I'm suggesting that I know it and other people don't. The, the problem is, is that there is a thing called presentism, uh, which means that, well, we're just going to look at world events in the present time and in historical times. And we're just going to put it in and say, well, does this make sense for the sensibilities of this particular moment in the year 2024? And if it doesn't, well, then these people were wrong or they're racists or they're colonizers and they may have been all of those things. Um, but the thing is, is that we need to understand the way people lived at a certain time. Now, we're not talking about something that happened many hundreds of years ago. This is only 1940 to 1949. And all of us have a direct connection for this, either by the fact that we were alive then, or in the case of me, you know, I was raised by people who were alive then. Okay. And they were shaped by these events. So I'm going for context and understanding. So 1940. All right now, clearly, as you might already imagine, this is going to be dominated by events going on in World War II, which, of course, was a dominant feature of the 1940s. All right. But very importantly, I want to, I want to put this together and see how it shapes up. So 1940, the United States of America now is not yet in World War II. Right. Yet at the same time. Um, you have the European war, which is now well underway. And Pacific are ramping up also, but that seems like it's a long way off or who knows what, what shape that's going to take. So 1940 is a very, very crucial year for the United States in the sense that it becomes apparent that the United States is going to be involved in World War II, specifically in Europe, right? Either that we're going to be in such a direct support of Great Britain, where we're effectively at war, or we're going to be drawn into it uh, officially, right? Which of course was to become the case. So here's what happens. Between September of 1939 and the spring of 1940, you have this thing called the phony war in Europe, where it's kind of like, remember that everyone alive then, right, if you were over 20 years old, remembered World War I, then just called the Great War. And that was something that was a traumatic event um, that had never been matched to that magnitude before, especially if you're a European. Um, 
And so the notion that Europe was going to launch itself into another catastrophe seemed beyond comprehension. And there was this, I don't want to call it a cooling off period, but it was the reason why it's called the phony war is because war has been declared and, and it's nothing's happened yet. You see, and this is a period of time where uh, the Germans, Hitler, was hoping that uh, Neville Chamberlain, uh, which was now replaced by Winston Churchill, where, where they were going to become so scared over the specter of Hitler that maybe they were going to cut a deal with the Germans or something like that. You see, and that actually, if Winston Churchill was that wasn't there, that probably is what would have happened. Right. So specifically speaking, the, the trigger here is that the German advance into Western Europe follows the same plan that was done in World War One, where you're going over, you're going west from Germany into what, Luxembourg, Belgium, and then, of course, into France proper. You know, this time, of course, you had the Maginot Line, which was a bit of a joke. So the Germans just went around it and um, it's a famous, uh, a famous line by George Patton and others actually that uh, fixed fortifications is a monument to the stupidity of man. You see, in a world of what was the modern world, which was mobile warfare, tanks, trucks, right, mechanized equipment, airplanes. You see, uh, so to build something that was a, a um, an immobile fortress like the Maginot Line um, was was medieval in thinking, you see, and easily defeated by literally just maneuvering around it. You see, now it was expected that maybe there would be trench warfare as it had occurred in World War One. You see, now the reason why trench warfare occurred in World War I is because mechanized forces were just at their very beginning. I mean, yeah, we had trucks, but most of the stuff that was going on in World War I was by horses, you see, and carts. And it moved very, very slowly, right? It was just the beginning of aerial reconnaissance and all the rest of that. And, and so because things moved slowly, both sides could amass forces to counter each other. And then you wound up with that stalemated trench lines, you see, like the, like the Western Front, for instance, It'd probably be the best example in history ever. But to avoid that, Hitler, who was in charge of the German armed forces, wanted to do the same thing as World War I, except this time we're going to do it as fast as possible before anybody can recover or mass their forces or get their act together. And that was called the lightning war or in German Blitzkrieg. And so therefore, before you know it, German forces are in France, you see? And the France decides to cut a deal with the Germans, creating the, Vichy French state, right? Now the Vichy French, Vichy is, is a town in um, is France. It's like a resort town. And it's where the armistice was signed, right? By somebody who was a kind of like this father-like trusted figure left over from World War I, right? Marshal Pétain. And so now, you know, the French are allowed to have their foreign colonies, right? And they're not going to be decimated by the Germans, you see. So the, the French laid down their arms. And um, of course, this outraged some people who were French nationalists, uh, like de Gaulle. And de Gaulle actually fled and set up shop over in England, vowing that Vichy France isn't really France and that the free French which he becomes the leader of, will return to liberate the puppet state of Vichy France. Now, when this is, of course, when you have Dunkirk 
right? And the British Expeditionary Force has to be evacuated out of this beach. And a reason why Hitler didn't actually decimate the forces at Dunkirk, which he could have. Um, it, it's very speculative. In, in my estimation, what Hitler was trying to do was he deliberately he didn't put his guard down. What he did was he he sent a gesture to the British that we are not going to annihilate your army when we have the chance to do so. Therefore, that's going to show, I don't know, an olive branch. And then maybe this is right at the point where Great Britain is going to try to avoid the fate of what just happened to France and Great Britain is going to come to their senses and cut a deal like France did, you see. And uh, like I said to you, with Winston Churchill, that was never going to happen. Um, but in the United States, this fall of France, if you will, this, create, this creation of this puppet, Vichy France state, spurs the United States into massive over budget spending, right? Which isn't as ominous as it sounds right now, okay? Where we're, what, $33 trillion in debt. So in 1940 money, we spent between one and a half and two trillion dollars that we didn't have, right? Which I don't know, I can't even calculate how much a trillion dollars is now. It's such a big amount of money. I find it hard to comprehend. I don't know about you. Right. But in 1940, how much money a trillion dollars must have been. But the thing is, is that the United States didn't have an army to speak of. We didn't have a Navy to speak of. We certainly didn't have an Air Force to speak of, you see. And we had to have this stuff like tomorrow. So that's what the money was for. Uh, and this is where the um, the United States industries started tooling over on behalf of the government into wartime production, right? Which didn't happen immediately. And so you still had some cars that came out that were 1941 cars, you see, but that was only a partial model year because it took a year to like retool everything. And what company is gonna build tanks? Which company is gonna build airplanes? Which company is gonna build this, that, or the other thing? Our shipyard industries, et cetera, were in full gear and we're cranking out battleships and aircraft carriers and submarines and bombers and aircraft to a tune that nobody has ever seen before and nobody has ever seen since. You see, and that's what that money was for. And so we went on a wartime transition here in the United States in 1940. Of course, going into 1941, um, the United States is continuing on as we were, right? But things are heating up in the Pacific in a sense. Now, I want to draw something for you between the Atlantic theater and the Pacific theater, right? The, the question would be, at the end of 1941, as you know, in December 7th, the Japanese attack us. The question is, what for, right? I mean, what was the goal of the Japanese to attack us? Uh, Pearl Harbor uh, in December 7th of 1941, right? The events of 1941 in the Pacific, as it specifically has to do with the United States, is that, remember I told you that the fall of France in 1940, right, led to Hitler essentially dominating all of Western Europe and Central Europe. Now, at the end, in, during 1940, the Japanese had made a pact with Hitler and Mussolini, right? So you had the Rome-Berlin axis, right? Now it became the Rome-Berlin-Tokyo axis, you see? And this is, I, I tell you this because it's important to watch. You can watch it now. You can watch it now. I mean, even before, like, for instance, I'll give you a contemporary example. When um, uh, right at the beginning of the Ukraine war, which is like remarkably two years ago already, right? Or even more. 
No, two years ago. Uh, China and Russia got together to create kind of like this cooperation pact, you see? So in other words, when Russia went into Ukraine, then essentially we all know that China was not only going to not interfere globally with anything that was Russia's aspirations, it was going to be in support of it. You see, so in a geopolitical way, this is very, very important posturing, extremely important posturing, you see. Now, you can say the same exact thing here going back into the era of 1940, 1941. In the United States, as we spoke about before when we were doing the 1930s, uh, was against Japanese expansionism in the Pacific, right? The Japanese had felt strongly like, who are you Western colonial nations who have colonized the whole world? Right, I'm, well, I'm talking about the the old colonial powers. Right, I'm talking about England, France, uh, the Netherlands, Spain, even Portugal. Right, which was a small player, obviously. Um, at least later on, you see, Japan is like, okay, well, we've achieved a world status by 1900, and essentially, what the Western world had done, right, the Western powers who already had their colonial empires is they said to Japan, sorry, you missed the boat. It's too late. You know, there's no more rooms at the end. And Japan's like, screw you. You know, I mean, how dare you and how hypocritical. And frankly, it kind of was. Now, I'm certainly not advocating for Japanese expansionism, but from their standpoint, it's easy to see, um, you know, where they're, where they're, they could play the hypocrisy card pretty quickly. You see, now, when France fell to Hitler, right, this is going to sound weird, but Hitler had this soft spot for his allies, right? Uh, he, Hitler practically lost the war and did lose the war trying to save Mussolini, right? And all of Mussolini's expansionism into North Africa and then the Mediterranean reason, region and Greece and everything else like that. Uh, Hitler has would have done anything to save Mussolini and tried everything uh, and diverted many, many of his forces. The whole world of World War II would have been different had Hitler not tried to go and save Mussolini. Now, since the, Jap the Japanese had signed this agreement with Mussolini and Hitler in 1940, in the autumn of 1940, called the Tripartite Pact. And the Tripartite Pact was a defensive treaty, which meant that it was designed to, it said that any country that wasn't already at war, right, any major power that wasn't already at war, that attacked the Japanese, were then going to be declared war upon by both Italy and Germany. Now, of course, the wording of that could only apply to the United States. So the tripartite pact, this agreement, said that, hey, United States, if you butt your nose into Japan's business too much, provocative degree that it creates war, or you attack Japan directly militarily, then that means you're going to have to face the most powerful force in the world, which at that moment seemed like Nazi Germany because right, Nazi Germany seemed unstoppable, you see. So that was designed as a deterrent to the United States. You see, now, in 1941, we have, by 1941, the Roosevelt administration had already started putting the squeeze on Japan in the same way that we've been, that we put the squeeze on, for instance, Russia. Right. If you remember at the beginning of the invasion of Ukraine, et cetera, that we put these huge sanctions on, that we're going to, you know, cut them off from the um, from the world as far as their ability to sell their oil and their gasoline and all the rest of that. And Russia is going to have to be in a position where they're going to be begging to get out of Ukraine just so that they can not be starving. Right. 
But meanwhile, what happened was Russia actually just turned around and sold most of its oil to, I mean, to what well, they're selling it to uh, a lot of it to China, etc. So the thing here is that in 1941, we were sanctioning Japan very hard. Right. We were trying to cut them off. We were trying to monetarily um, um, quarantine them, to use a term, if you will. And um, Japan is an island nation with no natural resources of its own from the standpoint of running a military. I'm talking about stuff of war. I'm talking about oil. I'm talking about high, uh, high octane aviation gasoline, the raw materials necessary to build aircraft aluminum. Okay, that sort of a thing. And um, so if you're Japan, you're saying, well, the United States is cutting us off, we're going to have to find our own sources of supply. And therefore, where can we get that? You see, and once we get our own sources of supply, the United States can go and pound sand. You see, we be dependent on them and we're not going to be want to be held hostage by the United States to do the United States' bid, bidding uh, based on them holding this sword over our head saying we're going to cut you off. You see, that's not real independence. So Japan uh, easily knew where the materials were and they were down in the Dutch East Indies, right? Especially in this long island archipelago, uh, now Indonesia, then formerly the Dutch East Indies. You see, that's like, if you look at where Australia is, it's like between Australia and Burma, that sort of a thing. And um, Japan knew where to get the stuff, but that would have meant war had they just gone and took the Dutch East Indies, you see, because you, Japan, right in between the Dutch East Indies and Japan is the Philippine Islands, which is now American territory since 1898. And now you had Douglas MacArthur, who's been out there since I think it was 1936, trying to train the Filipinos to defend their homeland, you see. So the United States had a real commitment in the Philippines, and we had all kinds of stuff on the Philippines, a big, you know, big base and Corregidor and um, B-17 bombers flying around and all the rest of that. So if Japan was going to bypass the Philippines and head down to Borneo, then it certainly would have wound up provoking war with the United States. So um, that actually led directly to the attack on Pearl Harbor, because the idea was that it, since we're going to wind up in war with the United States, We'll just attack and knock out the Pacific fleet at Pearl Harbor, which Franklin Delano Roosevelt has conveniently during 1940, 1941, moved from San Diego to Pearl Harbor, about 2,300 miles closer to Japan. And essentially, what we wound up doing is putting the Pacific fleet within range of the Japanese Navy. Um, and that's actually what. The idea for the Japanese was to attack us at Pearl Harbor, knock us out, and then the J Japanese would go when they would run and take whatever they wanted to in the Pacific, including the Philippines, including the Dutch East Indies, including the M Malay Peninsula, right, which included Singapore, um, of course, the big base of um, the British, and uh, many other things. And then by that time, Japan... Uh, wagered that the United States was going to be embroiled with a war in the Atlantic against the Germans in support of Great Britain. And then we were not going to want to fight in the Pacific because we were going to have our hands full. And so therefore we would turn around and make a deal with the Japanese and say, all right, look, you know, you can have Borneo and you can have this and you can have that, you know, just and, and then we'll cut a deal with them, you see? And then of course, Japan would walk away with 100% more than it had before. Uh, the prejudice that the Japanese had towards us was that we were a bourgeois nation who were so 
corrupt in our own self aggrandizement and life pleasures, right? Uh, that we were so involved with our own um, getting rich and making sure we had a new appliance every year or a new automobile every year that we really weren't going to care. We didn't care about anything, you see. And that's the Japanese prejudice that they had against us was that they had this will, they had honor, they had things worth dying for, and the Americans weren't going to have any of that. So we were just going to give up, you see. Um, unfortunately for the Japanese, they the the way that the attack on Pearl Harbor was handled was enough to create the special sauce that enraged the United States enough against the Japanese that we wanted our revenge. And it took care of all of that. Now, in 19, late 1940, as I said, the Hitler wanted to give some war booty to the Japanese, right? I said he was, he, Hitler, was sympathetic towards, you know, his allies. So he gave, you know, he, he was favorable to Mussolini and, and everything that was going on in the Mediterranean. And as far as the Japanese were concerned, right? And this is in the summer of 1941. And he gave the Japanese the green light. He, Hitler, to give, gave Japanese the green light to go ahead into a place called French Indochina, you see, and actually take over, right? The Japanese in the Pacific. Now, the reason why Hitler had the, you know, I don't want to call it the authority to do that, but he did have the authority to do it because guess what? French Indochina was still French because the deal with Vichy France made it so that all of the overseas empires of France were still under Vichy French control, you see. And since Vichy France was just a puppet state of Germany, well, Hitler said that the Frisky French needed to let the Japanese come in and take over, you see. Now, since nominally the French were an ally of the United States and Great Britain, then that means that that was the last straw for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. You see, so in 1949, when the when the Japanese now have a French uh, um, a free hand in Vietnam. Um, because Hitler okayed the Japanese to do it. Then uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt put the final series of boycott slash sanctions in place against Japan. And that was, we are completely 100% cutting you off from all sources of oil and high octane aviation gasoline. And at that point, the timer was on, you see, because at that specific moment, Japan said, how much, how much oil do we have and how much gasoline do we have? Well, they figured they had a, um, a reserve already of about two years. And so that means that to actually have a modern military that can carry out operations, they now were necessitated in going and invading Borneo, which would mean war with the United States. So the minute that we put those final set of sanctions on Japan. The timeline was on to Pearl Harbor. You see how the connection is between what happened actually in France under Germany led to what happened in the Pacific against the United States. All right, now, of course, if you were gonna to speak to somebody in the Japanese government, they would say that the Japanese invasion or not invasion, but attack on Pearl Harbor was essentially something that was created by the United States, that the United States put Japanese in such a position that their embargo of everything that they needed was so severe that it was literally a provocation of war against Japan. And then Japan actually had no alternative but to invade Borneo. And so if you were going to speak to a Japanese person in charge back in those days, they would say that United States of America caused World War II in the Pacific. Right. Now, I tell you these stories because these are very important and they apply. These things have not changed as far as political and military uh, rationalizations and rhetoric from that moment till now. All right. 
the names changes, the faces change, all the rest of that changes. You see, so of course, now you've got Pearl Harbor, right? And then we flip over to 1942. And then 1942, the United States still really doesn't have anything as far as hardware or military gear. Our um, industrial machine didn't really ramp up until, you know, and, and started producing the fruit of that labor until 1943, you see. And, um, and then things were going to change material at that point. But in 1942, we're building up our forces in Great Britain, right? Most notably the 8th Air Force. So we're creating an entire Air Force in Great Britain, um, which it wasn't going to become operational uh, until mid to late 1942. Now, the first joint operation that the United States had with the British um, was in North Africa, okay? That is November of 1942. And that was called Operation Torch. And it introduces Dwight David Eisenhower into the theater. It introduces um, Bradley and Patton and all the rest of that stuff. You know, if you ever watch the movie Patton, that's literally the position of the movie starts off with him and, you know, these, these states where, you know, you have these North African countries and their resplendent uniforms marching around, et cetera, camels and all the rest of that. And um, so we're with the British now. Um, Rommel gets driven out of North Africa. We invade Sicily and then into the Italian theater right, into 1943, right? But 1942 is absolutely critical because 1942 in the Northern European um, war, 1941 brings what Hitler wanted to do in World War II, right? World War II wasn't about fighting the British for Germany. It wasn't about fighting the French for Germany. It was about taking Russia Right. Now, this is heavily done and read about and written about in Mein Kampf of Adolf Hitler's, okay, where he said that what really needs to happen is Germany needs to actually expand eastwards, right, going through Poland into Ukraine, into Russia, and actually taking that entire region as Germany's own. Uh, as if it were the United States in the 19th century going west and taking the entire Plains states and Western states right to California and the Pacific Ocean, right? That's where, that's the way Hitler saw it. You see, so now in 1941, Hitler flips on his ally, which is Russia, and actually launches the largest land invasion in history, Operation Barbarossa. You see, and they actually sweepingly go into Russia, you see, and the Hitler gets stopped for the first time, eventually at a place called Stalingrad, right, which is an incredible story. Um, and that is what's going on in Europe during this time. 1943 is really a turning point in many regards. Right, 1943, the American military machine has reached a point of fruition where we're able to flood areas with tanks, airplanes, um, ships. We're giving uh, Great Britain ships by the handful. Um, and we're sending all kinds of supplies to Russia as well. You see, now, one of the major things that was going on in 1943 that was a turning point was um, the submarine war against the British and American and Canadian merchant fleets that were bringing this massive amount of war supplies from South America and North America over to Great Britain. You see, so remember, this is always like a war of attrition. If Germany can stop that flow of equipment going to Great Britain, then maybe Germany can win the war, right? So therefore, the submarines were sinking a lot of stuff, right? German submarines. 
But by 1943, we had enough ships and uh, the escort vessels, and we had enough technology that we were able to actually reverse the submarine war, where the Germans, instead of being the hunters, were now being the hunted. You see, and that strictly had to do with the amount of material uh, that we were able to produce as much as anything else. I mean, we had our gadgets. We had um, high frequency direction finding, which is in other words, you can locate a German submarine because they were constantly radioing back there, you know, for instructions, et cetera, back to France. And we also had uh, the British developed a smaller and smaller radars and which we mass produced and then you could actually take a radar set and put it in an airplane and um an airplane can fly can find a submarine surfaced and then swoop out of the clouds and attack it you see so technologically there were many changes and many advances not the least of which um was the ability to break german codes Right. Speaking of breaking codes, uh, going back a year into 1942, the United States, because of code breaking, was able to actually, before anybody thought it was possible, um, hand the Japanese Navy a decisive defeat in June of 1942 at a place called Midway Island. You see, so it would put the German, uh, the Japanese Navy on its heels and therefore it shifted over from a naval war to primarily um, war on land between the United States and Japan, uh, which turned out to be a place the first time that happened was in Guadalcanal, which was in August of 1942. So we were in direct land confrontation with the Japanese at this point. But our priority was still Europe first, right? And um, I want to stop for a minute and see if anybody has any questions about anything I've said up to this point. <clears throat> so 1944. The American war machine is in full blown gear. Okay. Everything's running, everything's humming. And we're pumping out equipment and airplanes and ships and new stuff uh, to the point where it's unbelievable. And um, 1944, the tide has really turned. And we're actually pushing the Japanese back towards the home islands. Uh, Germany is being pulled, pushed back by the Russians now who have launched a massive counteroffensive against the Germans and are pushing the Germans back to their own homeland, okay, in the reverse fashion of, of Barbarossa. And uh, now the allies are trying to figure out, the Western allies, right, under Dwight David Eisenhower, trying to figure out what is the best way to open up a second front in Europe, right? Now, the United States had always wanted to just attack Western Europe. We always just wanted to attack France. And it was the British who kept warning us that you can't just do that. Um, they had had their eyes bloodied several times trying to invade the continent. So it finally comes to fruition in the summer of 1944. Right. And of course, I'm talking about the D-Day landings in Normandy, finally opening up the second front is what they called it. It wasn't really second front. It was really a third front because the second front would have been uh, the first front would have been um, Russia against Germany. The second front would have been uh, Italy. So really, you know, the invasion of Normandy was more like a third front. OK, but. Stalin, I want to show you something here because this is important after the war. Stalin had felt as though the British and the Americans were dragging our heels and actually launching an invasion in France deliberately. And what Stalin's premise was that, all right, it's no secret that the Americans hate the communists. It's no secret 
that the Americans want to see Germany defeated. So the reason why America and Great Britain isn't really taking the heat off of the Russians by launching a second or a third front in France, which was going to force the Germans to send all these forces to fight this new invasion. But the reason why we didn't do that until the summer of 1944 was because we wanted to see the Germans and the Russians annihilate themselves. You see? Now, this is an important point because it explains or seeks to explain behavior of leading on the parent a paranoid of one Stalin and wanting to have this entire buffer zone immediately post-war um, so that Russia is never going to be invaded again through countries that it's not in control of, you see. In other words, the Iron Curtain and the countries behind the Iron Curtain, right? So if Stalin was correct, in his assumption that the prejudice against the Russians and were the communist Russians, right? Which are synonymous anyway, in that case, that essentially the West was not their friends and therefore they, the, the Russians had to be paranoid against the West at all times. You see, and this is very important distinction right here, right? That the Russians thought, Stalin thought that the Americans and the British were just out to annihilate the Russians anyway, you see. So the fact that we hadn't opened up a second front until the summer of 1944 to take the heat off of the Russians proved it. You see, this directly leads to Russia's behavior at the end of the war and what it felt like it was going to need to do to protect itself in a hostile Europe against an emergent, victorious allied power, right? So, um, and then of course, D-Day occurs. Um, the French are liberated. Uh, eventually Paris is liberated and uh, we're headed back over towards Luxembourg, Belgium. It's the reverse of what the Germans had done. See, and you've got Montgomery in the north and you've got Patton in the center, right? We're still fighting in Europe. Uh, and I mean, in uh, Italy, I should say. Um, we had managed to get to about Rome by the time the, um, the invasion of Normandy occurred. Right. So this sets up the stage for, you know, if you've ever, like I said, if you're a student of Patton or the, the Atlantic War, the European War with Montgomery and Bradley and Eisenhower and all the rest of that, this is all red meat right there. It kind of seemed as though the United States was going to be and, and the British were going to be victorious by Christmas time of 1944. I mean, after all, the Russians are coming from the east and the Western allies are coming from the west and the, the Germans are hightailing it, if that's what you want to call it, back to their own country, you know. And uh, that's where people started getting a little bit silly with what the Japanese famously called victory disease, right? And they were referring to themselves when they said that. Certainly leading up to the debacle at Midway for them. They analyze their own self failure and say, what the hell happened here? Us Japanese are pretty smart. How do we get our asses kicked at Midway like this? And they said it was victory disease. We were so confident in ourselves. We were overconfident, you see. And now this is where this starts creeping in even for us is that the notion that Germany was going to be capable of launching a major counteroffensive anywhere before the war was over was something that we really didn't take into consideration. It just seemed like the whole thing was going to be rationally over, you know, and then which brings us to um, which brings us to the winter of 1944. And where the Germans launch a massive counteroffensive in this desolate a uh, place, uh, this wintry, mountainous, forested place called the Arden Forest, right? Which was call then called the Battle of the Arden, which world knows by its nickname, the Battle of the Bulge. 
you say. Um, and after the Battle of the Bulge was over, then um, we returned to entering the Western frontier into Germany. And then it became kind of like, all right, the war is going to be over soon. It's just a matter of when, right? In April 1945, um, April 30th, 1945, Hitler commits suicide in his bunker in Berlin. It's also notable on April 12th, 1945, Franklin Delano Roosevelt dies, you see. Um, another fun fact about that is that both Hitler and Roosevelt came to power in the same year, 1933, and they died in the same month as well, right? If you find that interesting. So, um, but here's where we come to the real nuts and bolts part of um, the 1940s, right? And we all know about the World War II history, right? And I could do an hour and a half presentation on so far as every single bullet point that I just gave you. The thing here is that this period of time, right at the end of World War II, creates the modern world that I know I grew up in, all right? You know, so in on December 30th of, of, night, of last year, I turned 66 years old, right? So if you're my age or around my age or older than me or even younger than me, um, you will have grown up in the world that was created right here right in 1945, you see, in 1945 now it's, all right, Germany is gonna be defeated, it's just a matter of time. How do we actually secure the peace, right? So now we have World War I, which was the war to end all wars. And now World War II, which was the war to end all wars, except more destructive, and with more modern weapons. I mean, humanity cannot go on like this. It can't, it just can't, you know? And Harry Truman, now the president of the United States, has emerged as the United States as a superpower in, in, the, in the first modern way that the United States is now the leader of the free world, right? It's the first time this has happened. The United States has never enjoyed this before. And um, I mean, when World War II started, I mean, Great Britain was still the first tier country and the United States was a first world country, but politically, geopolitically and geomilitarily, the United States was a second class power, you see? And we, it's hard to even comprehend that, but, that's, but we emerged from World War II as the first actual superpower, right? Now, so did the Russians, but a big distinction between the Russians and us is that we were the sole possessor of nuclear weapons. The sole possessor of nuclear weapons, you see? And that made a big difference, right? That was the trump card, you see? And it's kind of like, we got nuclear weapons and you don't. So what? go sit down, you see. And the United States at that point emerges as we, we have right to this day, you know, um, as what recent rhetoric has told us that the United States is the indispensable nation and we are the leaders globally and, and politically and geopolitically and everybody else or our allies rally around us for leadership. I mean, where did that all come from? It came from, you know, our emerging in 1945 as the only Western nation, right? That had not only nuclear weapons, but we were in a position to protect everyone. You know, think about it this way. The United States was the only major combatant that wasn't that our land mass, our factories, our towns were not burned and bombed and our economy devastated and everything else like that, you see. And we emerged from World War II and 
in, in a, on top of the world, right? We had confidence and not only that, but this is very important to understand. You know, I'm a person who grew up during Vietnam and, uh, you know, the last people taken off the, the roof of the embassy in Saigon in 1975, that was within a couple of weeks of my graduating high school. All right. And so I had always imagined that that was a war that I was going to wind up being in one way or the other. And the draft had, uh, fortunately for me, had ended, uh, I think it was three, but nevertheless, um, the war had a big effect on, on everything and everyone. I'm sure that you know what I'm talking about. And um, in, in, in 1945, the United States of America emerged with this kind of confidence, you know, and our military was, I mean, it was noble. It was just, uh, we had, we had um, eradicated clearly evil people with evil intentions, right? And the difference between that and going fast forwarding, and we'll do this next time when we do our next series. Uh, it's, you know, if you, the thing with Vietnam is, is that it was tainted by the notion that why are we there? We shouldn't be there. We're baby killers. Um, why don't we just leave them alone and all the rest of that, you see? Uh, in World War II and the veterans of World War II, you didn't really have that. It was more of a, it was more of a, we, we did the right thing. We stepped up, we sacrificed, and it was noble. A big psychological difference, you see. You know, you get these kind of analysis for me because, because by trade, uh, besides the history thing, I mean, I, my, my practice where I deal with psychology and sociology and intergenerational interpersonal dynamics uh, on a daily basis. So I tend to focus on this sort of a thing. So 1945, Here's something that we need to look at, right? 1945, when the war was over, right? And we're talking about May in Europe and we're talking about in uh, by August slash September in the Pacific, right? There were countries in this world, in Africa, in Asia and other places that had been colonized in the 19th century or before. And in 1945, there was a real turning of the page about with the United Nations being what it is and um, us looking towards some sort of a peaceful future. Uh, that means that countries that never had a chance that were colonized before, we're gonna be able to emerge as their own country for the first time probably ever, right? I mean, take a country like Korea, which we were gonna be in, in a war in, in, a, in a matter of five years, right? But the thing is with Korea is Korea was annexed by Japan and uh, right after the Russo-Japanese war, right? Early on in the 20th century. And Korea was essentially just a, um, it was annexed. By Japan. And, and now at the fall of the Japanese in World War II, Korea had the chance now to essentially become its own country. You see? And you know, they didn't really have a government there. They didn't have a, a system of their own to fall back on. Um, so one had to be created. That's why there was this artificial line drawn in Korea at the 38th parallel. You see, so the country could actually develop some modern infrastructure as far as political um, to govern a country. And of course, the, um, the Russians, because they had entered, the Russians had entered the war, had declared war on Japan um, right at the second dropping of an atomic bomb, that one on Nagasaki. And now all of a sudden Russia declares war on Japan. So before the war is over, J uh, Russia now has carte blanche to go and just sort of sweep up any area between Russia through China into, you know, the Korean frontier. 
and 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 under the guise of actually killing Japanese, which they're now at war with, actually mop up as much territory as possible and influence as possible. So the in 1945, the Americans who saw the conquest of Japan as a personal victory. There is no way that the Americans were going to allow Japan to be carved up the way that Germany had been carved up into occupation zones, right? We already had several months of experience with working with the Russians because the Japanese war ended months later than the, than the European war. And the Americans were like, no way are we gonna allow Russia to have half of Japan or part of Japan. You know, the United States, remember going back to Pearl Harbor, this was personal, you see? And, you know, with as far as Japan was concerned, even the, even the British were second class, as far as Japan is ours. And so what we did was we gave half of Korea to Russia to administer temporarily until the, the Koreans could actually have their own government, you see. And uh, so of course this division between North and South was only supposed to be temporary. And of course the Russians put in a government that reflected their own values and their own system of government, which was communist. And we put in a system of government that reflected our own system of government and values, which of course was for want of a better term, democratic, you see. Um, more on that later. And so that's an example of, of a country that was a colonized country that seeks to be independent, you see? Look at all of the countries, it, look at the Belgian Congo and all the rest of these things that were in Africa that had been colonized by the Europeans. Um, this is the first time in, in modern history that these, that these countries had a chance to actually emerge as their own country, finally, right? Because after all, the United States is for freedom. We're for independence, right? You've read the Declaration of Independence. I mean, look, we were under a colonial rule in 1776, and we were the benchmark of a country that looked, or an aspirational country that looked at its colonial oppressors and said, you know what, we're out of here, you get out of here, we wanna be our own country, you see? So ironically, countries that we wound up being at war with later, uh, most notably Vietnam, right, looked at us and uh, Ho Chi Minh actually used the Declaration of Independence and said, we be outside of, out of colonial control, right? Uh, just like the Americans in 1776. Now, France is an interesting example here. What happened with France is that unlike the British and unlike the Spanish and others, right, who were colonial empires, um, France, refused to relinquish its hold on Vietnam, all right? As far as France was concerned, Vietnam was theirs, right? French Indochina was French Indochina and was going to be French Indochina, you see? So unusually, after the war, World War II, France was not going to relinquish French Indochina, you see? So what happened here was de Gaulle, who was deeply humiliated and France was deeply humiliated over its behavior early in the war, World War II in 1940, where they just, they just handed over um, you know, the kingdom to the Germans. Uh, de Gaulle wanted to recreate a sense of honor and a sense of first world poweredness to France. And one of the ways that he was going to achieve that kind of status um, was by not giving in to the pressure of the United States 
or follow the example of the now weak Great Britain. And France was going to go ahead and they were going to keep French Indochina. The hell with everybody. And France also was in a position where the new power of the United States at the end of World War II was something that France deeply chafed at. You know, it was kind of like, I don't know, it's kind of like watching your children like exceed you and everything and you become irrelevant. You see, it's, it's like it's hard to take. And uh, as far as France was concerned, they were part of the old Europe and they were, you know, they had a certain grandeur and history, et cetera. And the United States was a bunch of, you know, immature and waver rich people who didn't know anything about art or food or making love probably too, for that matter. Right. I threw that in. And um, the thing, and so de Gaulle wanted to turn around and say, no, 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 we're not going to do what the United States wants to do. We're going to do what we, France, wants to do. We are going to regain our stature, right, as a first world nation, you know, and resist this now Americanization of Europe. You see, which, of course, was a big thing after the immediate post-World War era because of the Marshall Plan and everything else like that, you see. And so uh, France was going to hold on to Vietnam and um, until, of course, they got their, you know, they got their hat handed to them in 1954 at a place called Dien Bien Phu, right, which is another story another day. We did a whole program on Vietnam, if you remember. So. This is very, very important period of time immediately after the war in this regard, right? Additionally, and this can't be overestimated, right? It could only be underestimated. It's something that really wasn't thought about much until like, I remember in 19, I think it was 1972, right? 1972. And I was just, I don't know, I was a uh, 14, 15, something, I don't remember. But this, but I remember this, this business of China and ping pong matches. And, you know, we were going to go to this mystical place of China, this mysterious closed place of China and open, re, uh, you know, negotiations and, and trade and all kinds of things. Wow. It was like landing on Mars, you know, and, and making a deal with the Martians practically, you know. And um, the thing is with China is that this leads right to today if you look at current events. Because in the 1930s, there was a civil war going on in China, right? And what happened was, of course, the Japanese, right, are all over China also. So what happens is that the civil war in China kind of gets put on the back burner during this entire thing. And um, you had Mao Zedong right, who was a, uh, a young man who was trained as a Marxist in France, right? And what he wanted to do was turn China into a real, honest to God, communist country. You see, not communist light, like the Russians, you see? You got to do it the right way, right? Mayo said. And of course, what happened was immediately after the Japanese were um, defeated in 1945, the civil war resumed in China immediately, right? So you had Mayo Zedong and the communist Chinese, right? And then you had um, the Chinese nationalists, you see? And um, the Chinese nationalists lose and get driven off the mainland to a place called Taiwan, formerly known as Formosa, you see? And this, is, this has tremendous ramifications 
tremendous ramifications. 1947, 1948, 1949, tremendous ramifications, right? And now you have the announcement that communist China is going to be, they're now the new power in China, right? So like the largest populace in the whole world now falls to communism. Now in this particular period of time, right, where you have this specter of um, Russian dominance in Central Europe, right, via the Berlin Wall, not the Berlin Wall, you, which wasn't until 1961, but you had the, um, the Iron Curtain, right, in all of these countries that were kind of like subjugated to communism. Um, and and so communism was seen the same everywhere in the world. It didn't matter if it was Asian communism or if it was Russian communism. We saw all communism as essentially some kind of manifestation of Russian communism, you see? And it becomes very, very confusing uh, in real time. I mean, it's one thing after all of these years to look back on it and say, well, no, they were important distinctions, uh, you know, whether or not that would have mattered, you see? So for instance, um, Mao Zedong, right, has this massive revolution in China, changes the entire country, this cultural revolution, right, this entire big leap forward and everything else like that, where the government from the top down is essentially micromanaging every aspect of life, right? And um, that's very different than the way that the United States sees itself. Because the United States back in those days, in the 1940s into the 1950s, was still a place, for good or for bad, that was basically running on a biblical sort of series of principles and the Ten Commandments and this notion that um, God had created everything and therefore governments were there to serve God's wishes. Right. And, you know, of course, communism was a kind of a, a godless thing. And uh, it, it seemed like it was completely incompatible to anything in the West, certainly in the United States. OK, which remained more of a religious place than Europe did, you know, certainly in the post-war era. And that's changed, of course, in the last 30 or 40 years. Um, but the thing is, with communist China, I mean, Truman took an enormous hit for this uh, politically because Republicans, of course, who, you know, it's the same fight between Republicans and Democrats, was the Republicans were like, well, look at that. The Democrats allowed the largest populous country to actually flip communist, you see, right under our noses, you see. So whoever's in president gets blamed for these things, you know. And um, so the, the notion that the people who lived in Taiwan and the way that Taiwan was going to govern itself uh, was based out of the fact that Taiwan was not communist and not part of the Chinese Communist Party, that it was a place that was actually uh, became its own entity out of more of a Western thing, you see, the Chinese nationalists. And, uh, you know, you see the vestiges of this every day um, when China is talking about reunifying, you know, Taiwan with the mainland under one communist Chinese rule. And, you know, this is the the way that that got started. And it had a tremendous effect in, in world events during the, Kore uh, the Korean War. Because, like, for instance, the reason why MacArthur got fired is uh, from Harry Truman was MacArthur saw Chiang Kai-shek, the leader of the Chinese nationalists and the Chinese nationals in Taiwan as having essentially been abandoned by the United States of America, right? So in, Truman, in, in MacArthur's mind, who was still thinking in terms of World War II, um, he was like, there's our allies, our allies in World War II. You know, Chiang Kai-shek was an ally of ours in the same way that 
Great Britain was an ally of ours, you see. And uh, somebody like uh, MacArthur felt as though we had just abandoned our allies on the outpost of Taiwan. So the Korean War for MacArthur was going to be a vehicle to actually expand a war into China. Um, and uh, to the point of a nuclear war, if necessary. And then we were going to essentially re -lib you know, liberate the Chinese landmass and repatriate our former allies, our allies, the Chinese nationalists, into and put them back in power in China. You see, so MacArthur had his own plan in war in in the Korean War. It was highly critical of Truman's notion of a limited war to avoid a nuclear confrontation and other things. And um, and of course, Truman fired him for insubordination. Uh, because he frankly was insubordinate. Um, I'm not saying he was wrong. I'm just saying he was insubordinate. So it's fascinating stuff. Um, uh, additionally, in um, 1949, which was a very important period of time, we have other things going on here, right? So we have... You have the formation of NATO, right? What is it? The North American Treaty Alliance or Association. I, for, I always forget that last word, right? But, and um, that's a big deal because essentially what we're doing now is we're throwing down the gauntlet and, and the Russians looked at that and said, well, you know, the Western allies are doing something provocative, which could only be there to actually challenge Russia, you see what I mean? So <clears throat> Russia looked at the formation of NATO um, as this pact, right, of these European nations against what the NATO countries now saw as this um, uh, expansionist, dangerous Russia, which is going to come flying out of Eastern Germany any minute and, you know, aligning with the sympathetic communist forces in France, particularly, and taking over the rest of the, con the continent, see? So Russia looks at the formation of NATO and saying, whoa, this is very provocative. It just goes to show you how we're never going to be allies and we're never going to be friends, because obviously NATO was there to box in Russia. And then Russia turned around and said that they were essentially the victims of NATO now, you see, and therefore they had the reason to act provocatively. See how that works? And that's something that is you know, you see that today as much as you did right at that moment and in moments before that, right? And um, it kind of goes back to a parallel sense about what I was telling you about if you were to ask somebody in the Japanese military government why they attacked Pearl Harbor, they were saying, well, of course, we had no choice because it was the United States of America who acted provocatively against us by chopping off all of our ability to have fuel oil, etc. So we had nothing else to do. Right. So it was the other side, the other guys who acted provocatively. That's why we have to do what we're doing, because we're just protecting ourselves. Right. Now, Russia said to themselves, we have to protect ourselves against this hostile Western forces that created NATO. Right. So perception is everything in these regards, you know, and you see the same kind of banter and the same kind of rhetoric right now with the Vladimir Putins of the world, right? And the argument of whether or not Ukraine is going to be a NATO nation, right? So is Ukraine going to be a NATO nation? So if Ukraine is a NATO nation, and we know that for Vladimir Putin, that's going to mean war because he doesn't want a NATO nation because right on his border, especially Ukraine, which Russia always considered part of Russia, right? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You see, so who's the provocateur? And um, these arguments keep repeating themselves. They keep repeating themselves, right? So in 1949, you have the formation of NATO, which geopolitically shifts everything into a modern posture that we literally into straight into postmodernism, which is right now. Okay, so now you have, what was it done? 
Sweden that became a NATO nation, right? And and other uh, Scandinavian nations, whatever, who were never going to join NATO, and and now you have this long border between Russia and Scandinavian countries, and and Russia just finds all of this highly provocative, and it, and it must mean that the Western nations are trying to box out Russia, which is causing Russia to have more of more of a I don't know, kind of like a, uh, a sympathetic viewpoint towards its own ambitions, because of course it has no choice but to stand up for itself, you see. And um, in 1949, also something that rocks the world is that the Russians launch, not launch, but actually explode their, detonate their own nuclear device. Right, which, by the way, looked exactly like our nuclear device, right, because it was our nuclear device, because the Russians had more spies in our nuclear program. Um, you know, it was just an extraordinary espionage operation. And it also starts something else in espionage, where you have a lot of different people who became sympathetic to the Russians, right, and because they felt as though in a world with nuclear weapons now, they were uneasy with the ability of the United States to continue to act morally where we had such a level of dominance militarily. So in other words, the world would only really be safe if the country with the nuclear weapons adversary also had nuclear weapons. So therefore we wouldn't, be egoistic, e egoistically stupid by saying, well, we could do whatever we want because after all, we're the sole possessor of nuclear weapons, you see? So a lot of sympathetic people actually leaked stuff to the Russians saying that this is gonna make the world a better place if the Russians have also nuclear weapons and that's gonna keep us from being stupid you see, and everything's going to be held in place and checked, right? And it's a very interesting way to look at that. And that is, uh, it, it's a, a new kind of period of history in this regard. Uh, I'm not sure that we're out of that, but I think we're still in that. And um, so those are two things that happened in 1949 right there that, that literally changed everything, setting up the standing. I mean, look at the kind of discussions we're having on countries, whether or not, uh, what will it mean if Iran achieves uh, nuclear, uh, uh, becomes a nuclear power from the standpoint of a weapon, all right? You see, these are the same exact discussions that were going on post-World War II with the same ramifications, you see? Now, on one hand, you can say that there's a lot of nations that have nuclear weapons, and there are, and well, you know, nobody's let the genie out of the bottle up to this point, with the exception of the United States, who used it twice in World War II, of course, right? But um, the question would have to be asked, non-prejudicially, if possible, whether or not a country like Iran uh, would find themselves limited by those same moral arguments, you see, if they were moral arguments that kept them from being used, that is. So, um, you know, it's the history repeats itself quite, quite thoroughly, right? And um, another thing about the late 1940s was, was another parallel to today, where when the United States, remember that trillion and a half dollars I told you about that we spent that we didn't have, right, that deficit money, that we built this entire massive Navy and Army and all the rest of this stuff. Well, you know, at the end of World War II, just like the end of every, end of every war, we, you know, we took most of that stuff, if not all of it, and we mothballed it, right? And we had like a small fleet. When Korea started, we, we, we had at the end of World War II in 1945, we had over 100 aircraft carriers in the Pacific Ocean, right? At the beginning of the Korean War, we, the, the best we could muster were two, you see? And, um, but the thing is, is that technology was changing very, very rapidly. So, you know, you just couldn't reissue all of the stuff that was World War II equipment, certainly when it came to airplanes and all the rest of that. But my point is that, that 
trillion and a half dollars, this trillion and a half dollars that we spent in 1940, right? Um, in addition to whatever else we spent during the war, which obviously you had to spend it, right? It was an emergency. After World War II, the United States, as I mentioned to you, was in a position to be the only intact industrial nation, right? The only intact industrial nation, right? I mean, Great Britain was intact, but they were bankrupt, okay? The United States made 70% of the automobiles that were in the world, that were used everywhere, the aircraft, the machinery, right? The tools, the farm equipment, everything that the, not only the developing world, right? As I told you, you had new nations that were developing, but the reconstruction of post-war Europe, right? And not to mention post-war Japan. Etc. We were able to repay everything that we spent as far as our deficit was concerned. You see, launching through the 1950s, an era of prosperity into the 1960s that was unprecedented in the entire world. And that's because we were the only intact country. And we, we still had the technology and we still were a nation where, you know, an American company was an American company. Um, and there was still this sort of national pride. Now, I'm not poo-pooing globalism. I'm just making a distinction, you see. Today, we have, we have uh, if you want an airplane, you could go to Boeing or you could just as equally go to Airbus, you see. Uh, upon the creation of the European Union, which was specifically designed to create a, a manufacturing and trade block to compete with the United States, and then finally emerging the Indonesian nations and um, places like India, right? not to mention even the European Union and other places, uh, and then uh, quite obviously China. Um, the United States now is hard pressed, as you may be aware, to actually even gain market shares and things that were back in the days that we're talking about were taken for granted that the United States was in the dominance in the field. You see, so the $33 trillion we have in debt right now cannot be paid back in the way that we paid back our deficit in the late 1940s to pay for World War II. We've got to be very, very careful about any kind of comparisons between this period of time and today, right? It was a different world. The United States was the country that had its American com companies that were building literally everything, electronics, radios, radar, band-aids, medicines, pharmaceuticals, fertilizing equipment, foodstuffs, shipyard technology, aircraft technology, aerospace technology, all of it. You see, not so much now, not so much now. In some cases, yes, you see. So any kind of, well, you know, we were able to pay, we had a national emergency in World War II, we were able to pay that off, and we have a national emergency now, whatever you want to call it, be it this, that, or the other thing. We do not have the infrastructure monetarily and manufacturing-wise and societally to pay it back, you see? So I don't want to make too much of a commentary. I'm just making a parallel statement of what something that was very, very important at this particular period of time, you see. Um, there was a question in the chat box. What was it? Quick thought about opening Pandora's box about how all this uh, FF culminates in 2024. And FF means what?
I don't know. And um, I feel like I should know what that means, but I don't. So forgive me. If you, if you want to um, unmute yourself uh, to ask your, your question and clarification, you can go ahead and do so. Mm hmm. Well, in any case, you could always follow up with an email or something and be glad to answer what, or I may even already answered your question. So anyway, uh, listen, I just took some things between 1940 and 1949 that I thought were really, really salient as far as understanding, you know, seminal events of that day, bringing it up to now. I mean, something that we can make an entire presentation of also was just the fact that Great Britain during this period of time in the second half of the of the 1940s, uh, like I said, they emerged from World War II just and they handed the baton to the United States and say, here, go for it. You know, uh, we're done. We've lost two generations of people and in the space of two generations, you know, between World War I and World War II, we're broke, we're tired, we're going inward. We're going to focus on ourselves and you, United States, protect us. You've got the nuclear umbrella, et cetera. Um, and um, so Great Britain, they turned around and they told India, hey, you know, India, do it. You know, and then India, of course, had to fight it out with Pakistan, which really, if you know the history of that, isn't over. You know, when you have Mahatma Gandhi and everything else in those eras also, um, you know, so the actual fact that Great Britain actually rolled up its empire, right, is quite significant. It's quite significant. The United States wound up in alliances with countries we never thought we would be aligned with just from the standpoint of trying to prevent communism, you know, so we, we tied our our wagons to all kinds of people who turned out to be very unsavory creatures uh, just because they told us that if we supported them, um, they would be a bulwark against communism, you know? So, I mean, the stories here and the time we could take on this is just, it's endless about how this literally created the modern world as we know it or the post-modern world as we're living in it. In any case, um, the hour and a half goes by pretty quickly. I, I hope that you um, that you liked the way I organized that. You know, the, the way I chose this uh, in the amount in the level of prioritization of importance of why I thought certain events were important, and obviously, you know, as a matter of editing, I can't put everything in that somebody else might have thought was important. Uh, I apologize for not having it in there, but you know, there's only an hour and a half that we have. So uh, I wanna thank you for uh, joining us on this and we'll be doing the second part of the series, right? Starting in April, uh, I think no, it was March. April 6th, oh, March, March 6th. Um, and uh, we'll be doing the rest of uh, the 20th century, decade by decade. Yep. All right, so thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you, Art, so much again for um, for doing this lecture. Like he said, we will be starting part two in uh, March 6th. So please keep an eye out on our website and in the email list of, of when that will be posted and registration will be open. Um, if you are registered for this one, you will need to re-register for part two of the series. Um, so please do keep an eye out for more information that will be released very shortly. Um, if you missed any of the previous sessions in part one, they are available on our YouTube page. Uh, again, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Art, for doing this uh, at the library. We always do appreciate it. Um, if you have any questions or comments or concerns, you can reach me, reach out to me or Art um, <clears throat> email, and we can uh, hopefully answer your questions. Um, in the meantime, please enjoy the rest of your week, and we will see you soon. Thank you so much.